Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So today, uh, we're gonna start talking about Bill Clinton. He's gonna be the first Democrat that we talk about here in the modern America. It's gonna be important because you're gonna start to see, starting today, uh, Republicans and Democrats are gonna be at each other based purely on political party. Let's go ahead and get started. So as uh, I did this yesterday when we started talking about George H.W. Bush, uh, about the predecessor before him on Ronald Reagan and let you know that he had passed away. Um, as we get ready to talk about Bill Clinton and, and we're done talking about in a historical context of George H.W. Bush, wanted to uh, uh, let you know kind of the what, what happened to him as a person. Um, he died in 2018, which is relatively close to when this is being recorded, uh, within a handful of years. Uh, so he died in 2018. He uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's after he left office and had a, str had a struggle with that. Uh, he passed away in 2018, and this is a picture uh, at his funeral with uh, the president at the time of the passing in 2018 uh, was Donald Trump uh, and, and his wife looking on. So, all the other presidents that we'll talk about uh, as of the recording of, of these lessons uh, are all still alive. All right, so today we're going to talk about Bill Clinton. Uh, this picture here to me is, is kind of crazy. Um, so that is John F. Kennedy that's behind me uh, shaking hands with a young high school Bill Clinton. Uh, just random thing. All right, so Bill Clinton comes into office. He is a Democrat. Uh, he doesn't win by in a huge majority, um, uh, uh, but he comes in uh, as a president. He has all these new ideas on how to do things, especially fiscally uh, with money and how America should spend the money. Uh, so Bill Clinton, and we're obviously going to talk a lot about Bill Clinton, uh, probably one of the most politically important first ladies we've ever had, or I should at least say powerful, is Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton. Now, uh, first ladies typically have some pet project that they work on. Uh, Michelle Obama, it was a, a school lunch. Melania Trump uh, was about uh, bullying. Uh, Hillary Clinton doesn't get a, a pet project like that. Hillary Clinton's uh, project uh, during Bill Clinton's time in office is to fix the uh, health care in America. Uh, so <clears throat> it is a, a huge thing. We'll talk more about it when we get to Barack Obama uh, when Hillary Clinton is part of his administration. That Hillary Clinton is tasked with a monumental concept of trying to fix and reevaluate and reform America's health care system. Uh, which is a little different than the rest of the world's because it's all private. All right, so uh, it is important to mention her because she becomes a, a, a very powerful politician herself uh, uh, up in, in the modern society. Uh, but let's talk about Bill Clinton and specifically his arch nemesis, all right? Uh, Speaker of the House is Newt Gingrich, all right? Uh, he is a Republican. Bill Clinton is a Democrat. Really, from this point on, it is like two complete opposite groups. Obviously, Republicans and Democrats have always squabbled. Now it's almost like two separate gangs like that, that are teamed off against each other. Uh, Newt Gingrich really does not like Bill Clinton. So this is a picture of Bill Clinton and, and giving him the stare down. It's Newt Gingrich behind him. So while Bill Clinton is a Democrat, the majority of Congress is still Republican. And they don't like Bill Clinton really, just because he's a Democrat. It, it, it's as simple as it gets now. If you're a Democrat, you don't like Republicans and everything they do is wrong. And if you're a Republican, you don't like Democrats, anything they do is wrong. You get in this hyper-partisan, I means like super political aspect really in the 1990s uh, that lasts up to present day and it's almost gotten more intense. The only real time you've seen any cohesion is after the September 11th attacks that we'll talk about tomorrow. But this is where you see it kind of go full force. It gets so extreme. This is Newt Gingrich. He is, introduces this thing to the American people called the Contract with America. Basically, they're just going to go around the president for everything, and they're just going to do all their own stuff, and the president can't do anything about it, and they're just going to cut the president out of the entire loop of doing stuff since the Republicans run Congress. 
It's an oversimplification of it, but it's clearly a power grab by the Republicans in Congress to take power away from the president. Bill Clinton is the president. He's like, nah, that's not going to be a thing. So uh, where the issues come, uh, and, and obviously they have issues on everything uh, with Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton, it comes to the budget, all right? So stay with me here. This might sound a little boring, but there is some really interesting and some drama that happens here that kind of all happens in this little story. So the president is required to write a budget and present it to Congress. Congress basically tells them, don't even bother because we're not going to look at your budget. We're going to make our own and then have you sign it because it's not law until the president signs it. Bill Clinton. Uh, now, Bill Clinton wants to spend a lot less money. All right. So one of the main things he starts spending less money on is the military since the Cold War is pretty much over. Uh, so he wants to spend a lot less money than the Republicans do who want to spend more money on the military. So he gives Congress uh, his budget. They say no. They make their budget, hand it to him to sign. He says no. Nobody signs a budget. Now, nowadays, this is almost like political football, as in people would threaten this all the time. When this happened in 1995, this was pretty crazy, and it was, it was a more extreme version of it. The government shut down, <laughs> as, as crazy as that sounds, so when no budget got passed in 1995, because neither side could agree, the government shut down. So the whole federal government, uh, like you know, like soldiers, all this other stuff, uh, uh, they're, they're having to get back pay later on. It was a huge fiasco. There is money still available to spend. You're just not legally allowed to spend it because you have to have it earmarked and basically say what you're going to spend it on for it to matter. Without a budget, you can't spend your money. So literally everything closes down and there's basically a standoff between Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton over who is the public going to blame for this, all right? Uh, and basically whoever the government blame or the people blame for it, they basically are the losers and the other person gets to create their own budget. Like, so it is a power move on both sides. Before I tell you who wins, there's a really important side story here that's going to play a big role here <coughs> at the closer to the end of the uh, election. In the White House, there is something called the White House Internship Program, all right? These are usually, uh, these are college students. They're like 22, 23 years old. They are the top of their class. And you get to go, if you are selected, and there's tons of applicants for it, <clears throat> uh, you can go work at the White House for free. Hooray. Uh, and a lot of people apply to this because it's a great thing to put on a resume if you're selected for this. So typically everybody shows up and they think they're going to like hang out with the president. That's not what happens. They go get put in the basement filing letters or something. So they don't ever actually get to do anything cool, but they get to say that, hey, they got to you know be in the White House internship program. It's, it's all the presidents do it. Uh, if you look here in the middle, uh, this is the most recent picture I, ju I just uh, uh, pulled off. Uh, um, this is uh, Donald Trump. You can see him in the middle with all these interns. Uh, so Bill Clinton had a bunch of interns as well. When the government shut down, all the paid employees at the White House weren't getting paid anymore. And Bill Clinton, who lives at the White House, you know, he's like, y'all go home. You're not getting paid. Y'all go home. We'll actually run this um, entire country, or not the country, but just a White House, the basic stuff, running, you know, stuff that paid people would do. I can have the interns do it. They're not getting paid anyway. So it made it a really weird situation, or not weird, just different, where these interns actually got to be around Bill Clinton all the time uh, while the shutdown, which which took a, a couple months, and it was like, oh my gosh, like this is cool. We actually like get to like do actual real stuff here with the president. Well, so Bill Clinton is married, married, and he is going to have an affair at this time period with an intern. This like basically has probably never happened before. Not that a president having an affair probably hasn't ever happened, but with an intern, presidents usually aren't around interns enough to like have that type of relationship, but it's a consensual affair. There is a, is a woman, she's 23 years old. She knows he's married, she's not, she's single. So this is on Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is the, is the shady one here. He knows he's married. He has an affair uh, with this uh, intern in the White House during this time period, all right? The government shutdown is going to end and we're gonna talk about it, who wins and then they all go back to their 
jobs in the basement for like the rest of the semester and then they go home that is the end of the story or so we think now granted this is super secret nobody knows about it nobody's upset the intern understood what that was that it wasn't a like a committed relationship and it was a thing that happened everybody's moving on nobody's upset nobody feels they were taken advantage of just moves on all right so the story should be in there should be no reason i tell you that entire story except it's going to come back to halt Bill Clinton here in a little bit and we'll come back to it. But the American people blame Congress and they blame, uh, uh, they blame Newt Gingrich for this. So because of that, Bill Clinton wins and he gets to make his own budget. And if you notice here, uh, this is the uh, uh, national debt, all right? If you notice, it goes up and up in the 1950s Cold War, that in the 1990s, it takes a, a dip. That is actually Bill Clinton. Uh, not only did he, uh, we spend less money than normal, we actually paid off some of our debt in the 1990s with these budget, uh, with the series of budgets that Bill Clinton passes, because he won in this thing. Um, he's going to get reelected in 1996 uh, uh, when he's up for reelection. It's not a landslide, um, because again, there, this is, there is the budget negotiations the Republicans in America vote for the Republicans, the Democrats vote for the Democrats, and it's just kind of tilts on basically the people who aren't Republican or Democrat on which way they vote. But Bill Clinton wins in 1996. Again, the Republicans still hold the majority of Congress and they're furious that Bill Clinton has beat them. So they gotta get him, all right? So the question here is, explain the power struggle between the Republican leader, Newt Gingrich, and the Democratic president, Bill Clinton, and how that led to a government shutdown. So pause me, answer that completely, we're moving on. So I know I took some time on that, uh, but it's important to give you some backstory calls. Things get crazy here in, in a minute. All right, so Clinton's foreign policy. The most important aspect of his foreign policy is a situation that arises with China. Specifically, it ends up being with uh, the little country of Taiwan. So this is a map of China, all right, uh, which we, we try to trade with. All right, there's, there's these tariffs and things. You trade back and forth with China. Let me move out of the way. The little island off the coast of China is Taiwan. This is where Chiang Kai-shek uh, had, had gone and set up shop. He's gone by the 1990s. Uh, so Taiwan wants to be a non-communist country because that's where Chiang Kai-shek went. They claim they're an independent country and they're a democracy. China's like... Nah, Taiwan is definitely part of China. And America tries to say at this point, no, they're not. They're their own independent country. All right, so America tries to like send some warships out there to kind of like intimidate China, which thinking China will back down. China kind of ramps up their military, like looking at America, like you're not actually like coming over here and getting in our business. And America at this point under Bill Clinton realizes we, we might be overstepping. Keep in mind, Chiang Kai-shek lived on Taiwan and we tried to claim that Chiang Kai-shek being the non-communist leader during the Korean War time period, <laughs> that Chiang Kai-shek was the uh, legitimate ruler of China because Taiwan is part of China. And now that <clears throat> China wants to actually take over Taiwan, we're like, no, it's a separate country. America's being hypocrites here, going over and kind of getting involved in a situation we probably don't have a lot of jurisdiction on. So America backs down. <clears throat> There's some weird tension between us and China because of this, understandably. So Bill Clinton, uh, kind of to smooth things over with China and to help out trade, goes to China and, uh, actually I do not know if he's at China. This is a picture of Bill Clinton on the right meeting with the, the leader of China, of Communist China at the time. Uh, they come up with something called the US-China Relations Act, which basically says, hey China, look, we're not trying to be jerks with you. Uh, you know, we understand you're communist. We're not big fans of that, all that, but we want to trade with you. So the US China Relations Act basically says trade between uh, America and China has no tariffs. It's basically free to trade back and forth. We think that China's going to buy a bunch of stuff from us and we're going to buy a bunch of stuff from China and it's going to be great. What really ends up happening is China just starts selling us a bunch of stuff and they don't buy a lot from us. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is starting in the 90s with the US-China Relations Act. This is the amount of uh, billions that we 
basically buy from China as opposed to what they buy from us. So we buy a lot more from China than they're buying from us, but Americans love it because everything is so cheap from China because their workers aren't paid as high as American workers, so the products are cheaper. This leads to massive uh, profits for companies like Walmart who buy most of their stuff exclusively from China and that's why their, their prices are so low. Uh, uh, so the U.S.-China Relations Act is a uh, situation that happens with Bill Clinton and China at the time, which leads to like the explosion of Walmart. Um, so the question here is, how did tensions with Taiwan lead to a massive increase in trade with China? So uh, pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. All right, NAFTA. I'll explain what it is, and I, I, I try to give a neutral view on this, and maybe because I'm, I'm flying too close to the sun, I remember this growing up. I can't, can't quite understand why they thought anything different than what happened happened. So NAFTA is passed by Bill Clinton. It's the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is Canada, America, and Mexico. The stipulation is, just like how the U.S.-China Relations Act, there is no tariff when you trade back and forth with China and America. We do this in North America. Uh, I think the hopes is, uh, without having to pay a tariff when it crosses the border from Mexico to America or from America to Canada or America to Mexico, that Mexico and Canada will buy more American products and helping out our business. Um, it really has the complete opposite effect, kind of. Um, America just starts buying everything from Mexico and buying everything from Canada. Uh, let me rephrase that. We buy everything from Mexico uh, because Mexico's economy is not as strong as America and the Mexican workers will work for a lower uh, dollar amount per hour than Americans will. So the products from Mexico are cheaper. So America just buys everything from Mexico. Uh, and Mexico isn't really buying anything from America. Well, the business owners learn this real quick. Uh, this is a GM plant here uh, in Michigan that's going to close down because of NAFTA. And they're like, oh no, like GM doesn't get any parts. No, all the parts still exist. They just went and built this same factory in Mexico, hired Mexican workers that work for less money, and then bring the uh, products in the United States, sell them for the same price. And so the owners of these companies make tons of money because of NAFTA. You know who really is hurt? the factory workers. These factory workers in America realize your job's just left. The job you used to do in America is now being done in Mexico. And so NAFTA really hurts working class factory workers because those factory jobs now exist in another country. It's very beneficial for the factory owners who make bigger profits. So it hurts the, the working class, but helps the, the owners. And uh, I, I've, I really struggle to figure out what did they think was going to happen uh, with NAFTA? Uh, they claimed they thought it would help everybody. I, I don't know what their rationale was for that at the time. But the question here is, how did NAFTA have a negative impact on many Americans who worked in factory and manufacturing jobs? So pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. So Bill Clinton gets impeached. This is where the wild political stuff starts. You start seeing it up, up to present day. Democrats, Republicans, right? Bill Clinton is a Democrat. The Republicans are in Congress and they don't like him. So they're out to get him. They are so out to get him. And this is, this is weird. I mean, this is, this is weird, just weird. Nobody, this, all right. So the Republicans hire a private investigator, a guy named Kenneth Starr. Kenneth Starr's job is to go find dirt on Bill Clinton. It's his only job. Taxpayer money pays for this dude to go dig up dirt on Bill Clinton so that the Republicans can get him in trouble. They don't really think there's anything to get him. I mean, there's, there's no like, he didn't do something to make him think that he's criminal. They're just trying to find negative stuff on him. Uh, there's this thing called the, the uh, Whitewater... Don't want to go too much in the detail. There, there's, there's, so they just hire this guy to go dig up dirt on the president because they're like, surely this dude's got a bunch of dirty laundry. Like, so he's done something illegal we can get him for. This is public knowledge. Like, so Bill Clinton even knows this dude is like 
trying to catch him doing something wrong just to get him in trouble. That alone is weird. So Kenneth Starr goes through and goes through everything he can find about Bill Clinton and comes to find out Bill Clinton really doesn't do anything illegal, all right? However, he does uncover that a couple years prior during that government shutdown in 1995, Bill Clinton had an affair with an intern. And he gives that information to Newt Gingrich. And Newt Gingrich is like, yes, give me that information. Now, while having an affair and Hillary Clinton would be furious and, and will be furious, obviously, because it's an affair, it's not technically illegal. Obviously, divorce and all that's a whole nother uh, a family uh, court situation, which does not happen. But uh, so you got to figure out how to get this like juicy gossip to like hurt him legally. So what Newt Gingrich does is gets this information. Bill Clinton does not know that Newt Gingrich knows this information and basically calls Bill Clinton down to Congress, all right, and this is a very famous screenshot of, of when this happens, brings him down to uh, the Congress in order to talk about the budget. Because remember, that's what the government shut down for previously is the budget. So they, they come down, so he's expecting to talk about the budget. Like he's thinking about all his numbers and stuff like, all right, you know, budget this, budget that. They swear him in because he's gonna talk about the budget. They make it official, all right? They swear him in like on a Bible. Uh, and you know, everything you say is, is the truth and all this other stuff. He's like, yeah, cool. All right, let's talk about the budget. And they're like, okay. So first question for you, Bill Clinton. Did you hook up with this intern? Like they just straight asked, like, this is on national TV. Bill Clinton without blinking says, no. And they're like, Hold on now, I need you to clarify, did you have an affair with this intern? And he goes, and this, this is mid him talking, uh, he uh, very famously says this, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Well, they had proof that he did. All right, because uh, they went and talked to her, and I mean, she didn't want to get in trouble. She was just, just a college student a few years uh, prior to this. Uh, and so she tells him the story. I mean, she's not you know, trying to get in trouble. So she was honest with him and told the story. So they have proof that he did do this. Uh, he has now broken a law. You know what law that is? I mean, this is how obscure and petty it has gotten between Republicans and Democrats. Since he was sworn in on a Bible, he has to tell the truth. When he said he didn't have an affair, he lied under oath. That's called perjury. He broke a law. They officially impeach Bill Clinton in the 1990s for lying under oath about something that in and of itself wasn't even illegal, but lying under oath is. Uh, and they're like, you got him, all right? So they have the votes in order to kick him out of office. So you have to vote, like two thirds of Congress has to vote for him to be um, uh, kicked out of office. It got weird. This is, so you got Clinton right where he wanted him. Ah, kick him out of office. When they actually go to vote on this, because impeach just means put him on trial. Uh, Nixon quit before he ever got impeached, but Clinton, first president to be impeached, since uh, Andrew Johnson, all right? So it had been like well over 100 years. Nobody in the 20th century had been impeached because Nixon quit. Uh, so when it comes down to actually vote him out of office, all the Republicans get cold feet. So I want you to look at this here. So the blue and red, blue are Democrats. Every, so the vote was, is he guilty of perjury? Did he lie under oath? Yeah. He did, which is a silly thing to bring up charges against considering the situation. Did he lie under oath? Every single Democrat said, no, he did not. I mean, he clearly did. Everybody saw it, but they're like, no, because they know they're, they're kicking him out of office. Uh, most Republicans say yes. There's some Republicans who at the very end, like, ah, this is weird. Like, are we really going to try to kick this dude out for like having an affair? Because <laughs> we're all politicians who hasn't had an affair. <laughs> Am I right? So even the Republicans get cold feet at the end, some of them, and he is voted, I mean, nothing happens. He, since he's not guilty, like since he's not found guilty, he is therefore not guilty and is able to go back to being the president. It took over 150 years, uh, pretty close, uh, 130 some years, uh, between the first impeachment of Andrew Johnson after the Civil War 
to Bill Clinton uh, since then. Uh, and we'll talk about when we get to Donald Trump. Donald Trump got impeached twice. And you know what? The votes looked almost just like this. Uh, because here is the Republicans out to get the Democrat. Purely because it's Republican and Democrat. Donald Trump, the votes look almost the same. It really appears it is just Democrats out to get the Republican, like tit for tat. Uh, and it's it, the political tension at the time up to present day is just, it's, it's gotten to the ridiculous level. So, but the question here is, explain why Bill Clinton was impeached and why he was found not guilty uh, and then it's kind of explained the political landscape at the time. So kind of explain uh, why the vote went the way it did uh, at the time. Uh, so pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. So the 2000 election, Bill Clinton serves two terms. He cannot run for a third term. That's, that's an official law now after FDR. So. In 2000, there's two people that are running. Nobody is super excited about either one of these guys. Uh, nobody hates them. There's nothing super negative about either one of them. Uh, you have Al Gore, who is Bill Clinton uh, without the personality. Al Gore is not a super fun guy. People joked about him being like a robot. People didn't dislike uh, Clinton's policies, uh, but it was all the drama uh, surrounding the impeachment and all that. They're like, oh, I hope we can move on from that. And then they picked, uh, and then the Republicans are going to run George W. Bush. This is the son of George H. W. Bush. And while nobody has anything bad to say about George H. W. Bush, he did lose re-election. So the question is, how effective is yet another George Bush being in the presidency? Are they going to be any more effective than his dad who couldn't win re-election? Um, so George W. Bush uh, 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 comes in and they run against each other. It is a very close race, like the closest race we've ever had. They, on election day, they actually have tied, all right, was who can win the most states. And it comes down to who wins Florida for who gets to be the next president of the United States. Well, uh, Florida, all the cities vote heavily Democrat, all the rural areas vote heavily Republican. Um, this is the this is the vote in Florida. Uh, it is within a few thousand votes of each other, all right? Out of like four million, five million people, five and a half million people, it's a few thousand votes difference. They're both at forty nine percent. Now, on the very first count, George Bush he wins Florida, and because of the Electoral College, whoever wins the most votes of Florida gets all the votes of Florida and would become the president. Well. So it gets weird when it's this close and it comes down to Florida. Uh, and it, once it's this close, there's different rules that kick into place. Al Gore can challenge this and make them count it again. So after they count all the vote, votes, it looks like Bush barely won. Al Gore says, make them vote again or, or make them count again, count the same ballots again. And they count them again. And then he says, count them again. Um, so this is not electronic. Uh, they start switching over to a lot of electronic uh, uh, stuff after this. Uh, th this hanging chads becomes a term people learn. You had to like punch out your votes. And like these guys are, are counting, making sure like, well, does it count if the whole part of the ballot like, like gets punched out? It's, anyway, they, he makes them vote again and again. Every time the vote is the exact same. Um, Al Gore makes them vote so many times that the Supreme Court has to get involved and basically say, we've counted this thing like 20 times. It's the same vote every single time. So there's a Supreme Court case, Bush v. Gore. So there's a Supreme Court case, Bush v. Gore, that says, stop counting. We've counted enough. It's the same every time. The president is George W. Bush. He won. He won every time he counted. We're not just going to keep recounting forever and George W. Bush becomes the president, barely makes it in. And one of the very weird, weird things that happened here that has not happened at, the, at, at this time when it happened in a really long time is more people in America actually voted for Al Gore than voted for George W. Bush. But since George W. Bush won more states, how the Electoral College works out, George W. Bush wins the election. Uh, so the question here is, explain how the Supreme Court became an important factor in deciding the next president in the 2000 election. So answer that completely. That's what I got for you guys. And then tomorrow, 
September 11th. All right, see you guys then.